Chapter 7 No blood, Dina said softly. No blood, Leah repeated. The yellow light made everything unreal, dreamlike, but it was easy to see that the door was as it had always been, solid, locked, boarded up, and dry. So it was a dream after all, Leah whispered, staring straight ahead. What a relief, Dina said, sighing. Leah knew she should feel relieved, but to her surprise she felt more frightened than ever. Let's go downstairs, she said quickly. Dina led the way down so Leah could replace the trap door. They were heading down the stairs when the doorbell rang. Police, a voice called from outside the front door. Oh, no, Leah groaned, raising her hand to her forehead. I forgot. I called the police. What am I going to tell them? Police, the voice repeated. This was followed by a loud pounding on the door. I don't know, Dina cried. I can't tell him I had a bad dream, Leah wailed. She pulled open the front door. A very young-looking police officer stood under the porch light in a dark blue uniform, one hand on his gun holster, one hand raised, ready to knock again. I'm Officer Beard, he said, his eyes studying first Leah, then Dina. What's the trouble here? Uh, it's okay, actually, Leah said, holding the storm door open just a few inches. Okay. His small, dark eyes narrowed in suspicion. Uh, yeah, Leah said, unable to conceal her embarrassment. I heard noises up in the attic. I mean, I thought I heard noises, but I didn't. What did you hear? The police officer asked, relaxing and allowing his hand to slide off the holster and down the side. I didn't hear anything. I mean, Leah turned to Dina for help, but Dina only shrugged. I went up to the attic. There is nothing there, Leah continued. I get a 302 call. Emergency, Officer Beard said, staring into Leah's eyes as if searching for the true story there. Mind if I come in and have a look around? No, I don't mind, Leah said reluctantly, but everything is okay, really. Leah held the door as the wary police officer came in. Then she followed him around as he made a quick survey of the house. Glad there's no problem, he said without smiling, returning to the front door after his search. I'm sorry, Leah told him sincerely. I was scared. I was all alone here. I thought I heard something. I'm really sorry. Don't be, the officer said, stepping out onto the front walk and noticing all the empty moving cartons stacked against the side of the house. This can be a scary neighborhood sometimes. You just move in? Yes, Leah nodded. Don't hesitate to call. Better safe than sorry. Know what I mean? Officer Beard grinned, revealing long, crooked front teeth. Thanks, officer, Leah said relieved. Thanks a lot. He reached up and touched the brim of his cap, a real movie cop gesture. Leah and Dino watched him walk down the drive to his black and white patrol car. Then Leah closed the door and started to lock it. No, don't close it. I've got to go, Dina said, checking her watch. Are you going to be okay? Yeah, fine, Leah said yawning. Now that I know it was all a dream. Jade and I went to this horror movie once, Dina said, where this girl kept having bad dreams, and the dreams started getting more and more horrible, and she couldn't wake up, and she knew if she didn't wake up, she'd be trapped in a dream forever, and the dream will become her life, and her life will become a dream. Jade thought it was really neat, but it gave me nightmares for a month. Gee, thanks for sharing that with me, Leah said dryly. They both laughed. I'll be okay, Leah said. Thanks for coming, she hugged Dina. You're a real friend. Go to sleep. And let's forget about tennis tomorrow. You look like a wreck, Dina said, pulling up her poncho and heading out the door. Thanks, friend. A few minutes later, Leah was tucked into her bed. The covers pulled up to her chin. The heavy cloud cover had parted and pale silver moonlight floated in through the twin windows. Leah saw the glare of headlights and thought she heard her parents' car pull up the drive, but it was some other car turning around. It must be quite a party, she thought. Mom and Dad don't usually stay out this late. She had just about drifted off to sleep when she heard sounds above her head. Dull thuds. First in one direction, then back in the other. The thud of shoes against the wooden floor? No, no, no. The sounds, this time like fingers on a drum, grew louder. Lying on her back, Leah reached up and pulled the sides of the pillow up over her ears. Holding tightly to the pillow, which muffled the sounds above her head, she fell asleep. You're sure it wasn't just a natural creaking of the house? Her father asked at breakfast, drops of milk from his cereal catching in his mustache. Leah shook her head and handed her dad a paper napkin from the plastic dispenser on the table. They were sitting in the small breakfast nook, sharp blades of morning sunlight jabbing through the dust-covered windows. No, I know those sounds already, Leah said, resting her chin on one hand, shielding her eyes from the invading sunlight with the other. 
We've got to get curtains up in here, her mother said, squinting. Leah, you want to trade places with me? You're looking right into the sun. Maybe there's a squirrel or two up there, her father suggested, lifting the cereal ball to his mouth and tipping it to drink the remaining milk. You must have been so scared, her mother said, struggling to remove a section from her grapefruit. I mean, to have called the police. Yeah, it was scary, Leah said thoughtfully. She had decided not to tell them about the blood pouring down the door, mainly since there was no blood pouring down the door. Bad enough that Dina thought she was cracking up. She didn't want to get her parents all worried, too. Could be squirrels, or even a raccoon, her father said, sipping his coffee. When he pulled the cup away, his mustache was soaked from it. How can he stand that mustache, Leah wondered, watching him dab at it with the paper and napkin. How could a raccoon get in there, Leah asked. They're crafty, her father replied. They can get in anywhere they want. You ever look carefully at a raccoon's paws? No, Leah said, laughing. They're unbelievably dexterous. He curled his big hand up and moved the fingers, a demonstration of a raccoon paw. Maybe it was a raccoon, Leah said, taking a sip of orange juice. Yuck, pulp. She made a sour face. I'm sorry, her mother said. I know you hate pulp. I couldn't find the kind you like. The supermarket is different here. That's okay, Leah said. She gingerly took another sip. I'll take a look up there later, Mr. Carson said. But from now on, if you hear noises, just ignore him, okay? He smiled at her, his eyes dark above the red-brown mustache. Don't panic. That's her motto, right? Right, Leah said, picturing the blood pouring down the door again. What a dream. Time to get a move on, her mother declared, glancing at the stove clock. We're working on the downstairs bathroom today. Both of Leah's parents jumped up and hurried from the room. Leah lingered at the table, scooting her chair over to get out of the sunlight. Don't panic, she said out loud, mimicking her father. Easy for him to say. That night, hunched over her desk, making her way slowly through an endless chapter in her government text, Leah ignored the scraping, tapping sounds above her head. The following night, lying in bed, thinking about Don Jacobs despite all her best intentions not to think about him, she forced herself to ignore the sounds again. Thump, thump, thump. Then back in the opposite direction. Thump, thump, thump. Mr. Carson went up to the attic as he had promised and came back down with nothing to report. I saw a few dust bunnies up there, he said, smiling. Maybe we've got very noisy dust bunnies. But I heard the sounds again last night, Leah protested, loud, like drum beats or footsteps. Her father scratched his head, wrinkling his face in thought. Could be a loose shingle. I'm going to have the roof checked in a week or so. Leah buried herself in her homework, trying to concentrate the sounds away. Late at night, lying in bed, watching the dim moonlight filter in through the new curtains her mother had just put up. She thought she heard a voice up there, someone talking in a low tone just above her head. Ignore it, she instructed herself, and the sounds did immediately disappear. The next night, she dreamed about the room above her head. In the dream, she was in bed, unable to sleep because of loud, persistent footsteps on the ceiling. She raised her eyes to the ceiling. The light fixture was shaking. The whole room began shaking then from the force of the footsteps. She dreamed that her bed started to slide across the room and she jumped up to run out in the hall in her pajamas. It was very cold in the hallway. She began to climb the ladder to the attic. She felt very afraid, not a daytime fear, but the tight that sweeps over you, controls you completely, weakens your muscles, paralyzes your mind, the kind of fear that comes only with a dream. The attic was dark and cool. When she clicked the light switch, it grew even darker. She crept up to the locked door. At this point, Leah knew it was a dream. She wanted to wake up. She tried to wake up, but she couldn't. She couldn't escape from what was to happen next. She heard a voice behind the locked door. It was a girl's voice, small and frightened, and sounding very far away. Leah listened at the door, heard the voice, then started to pull away the heavy boards that blocked the doorway. To her surprise, the boards lifted off easily, as if they were cardboard, and floated away. Leah hesitated, then placed her hand on the doorknob. It was burning hot. She screamed and jerked her hand back in pain. I want to wake up, she thought. Please, let me out of this dream. Almost against her will, her hand went back to the doorknob, ignoring the searing heat, turned it, and pushed the door open. Leah peered into the small room. The light inside was blindingly bright. Someone was in the room, but Leah couldn't see who. It was too bright. She had to shield her eyes. Someone stepped forward, out of the light, a dark, faceless figure. Who are you? Leah cried. 
Without looking, she knew it was someone or something horrifying, something hideous, some creature bringing evil that was waiting to be unleashed. Who are you? she repeated, raising her hands up as if to shield herself. And the bright light faded, and the dark figure moved closer, coming into focus. No! Leah shrieked as she recognized the smiling figure looming before her. It was Marcy, Marcy Hendricks. Leah woke up. She sat straight up in bed, shaken, uncertain, bathed in cold perspiration. She couldn't decide whether she wanted to laugh or cry. This, her third week at Shadyside High, turned out to be a long, lonely week. Her parents busied themselves with fixing up the house and had little time for her. Dina had a new boyfriend, a tall, blonde, skinny basketball player named Luke Appleman, and was spending all her time with him. Leah had tried being friendly with Dina's friend, Jade, but Jade was very popular and very busy, involved in a million clubs and with a million kids, and didn't seem to have much time for Leah. Leah tried not to think about how lonely she was, but that was just about as easy as not thinking about Don Jacobs. She had seen Don a couple of times during the week. Both times he was with Marcy. Both times he gave Leah shy, apologetic glances before quickly turning back to Marcy. Marcy, of course, deliberately cut Leah both times, looking sharply away, an unpleasant scowl on her face. Saturday night found Leah home alone again, her mom and dad at another party. She and Dina had plans to go to the movies at the Division Street Mall, but Luke called Dina at the last minute with two tickets to a rock concert at the big auditorium in Waynesbridge, and Dina, apologizing again and again, begged Leah to understand and went off to the concert. Leah watched TV for a while, clicking the remote control, watching 10 seconds of this and 10 seconds of that, not really paying any attention to any of it. She thought of doing homework, but decided that would just be too pitiful. She thought of going to the movie at the mall by herself, but that would be too embarrassing especially since a lot of kids from Shadyside High were bound to be there. Maybe I'll go rent a movie, she asked, clicking off the TV and pacing back and forth over the threadbare living room carpet her parents hadn't replaced yet. She decided against it. By that time, on a Saturday night, all the good films will be rented. Eventually, a little after nine, she went up to her room, planning to lie in bed and start the new historical novel her mother had taken out of the Shadyside Library. Just what I need. An escape back to another century, she told herself. She had read only a few pages when the sounds began above her head. Tap, 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 tap. Thump, thump, scrape, thump. Trying to ignore them, she turned the page and kept reading. But the sounds grew louder, more insistent, as if urging her to listen, forcing her to pay attention. Again, she thought she heard a voice up there, or voices, talking quietly, languidly, as soft as a rush of wind but not the wind, definitely not the wind. Leah put the book down and got to her feet, her eyes on the ceiling. The locked room, she realized, must be right above her room, right above her head. Thump, scrape, thump. The voices up there rose and then faded. This is driving me crazy, Leah thought, her heart pounding. She remembered her dream, so silly, Marcy Hendricks trapped in the boarded-up room. And the other dream, the dream with the blood pouring down the door, the dream that was so real. She pinched her arm, hard, I'm awake, I'm not dreaming, this is real life, not a dream. And the sounds were still up there. I'm going up, she decided, as she pulled herself up the metal ladder and struggled to push the trap door away from the opening. She was surprised that she felt less frightened this time. She felt only anger and curiosity. What was going on? Who or what was making the noise? And why? Just to drive her crazy? Dad's probably right. It's probably just a roof shingle, she told herself, feeling around on the wall and turning on the yellow light. Her own shadow jumped in front of her, startling her. Don't panic. Surveying the long, low attic, she carefully made her way over to the boarded-up door, walking slowly, deliberately, listening hard. She stopped at the door and leaned forward. She held her breath. Yes, she could hear voices. Too low to make out the words. But someone was in there. A girl. It was a girl's voice. Her dream came back to her. I'm awake now, she thought. Awake. Awake. Leah pressed her ear against the door. Then, picturing the flow of blood down the doorway, thought better of it, and pulled her head back. She could hear the voice, but she couldn't make out any of the words. Who's in there? Leah cried, not recognizing her high-pitched voice. 
Who's there? She waited for a reply. The voice on the other side of the door stopped. I know you're in there. I heard you, Leah called, too excited to be afraid. Silence. Even the wind outside seems to stop its steady rush. I'm going to solve this mystery once and for all, Leah decided. But how? Are you in there? She shouted. Silence. She raised both fists and pounded on the door. Are you in there? Can you hear me? She listened. Silence. Her heart was racing. Her eyes went out of focus, then focused again. She felt out of control. But there was nothing she could do about it. She had to know who was walking around in there, talking, making those sounds. Leah grabbed one of the two-by-fours and tugged at it. The heavy board wobbled in her hands. It's loose, she realized. I can pull it right off. She steadied herself and prepared to pull. An ear-splitting roar, the roar of a bomb blast, made her drop the board. She stood paralyzed by the deafening noise, just as enormous pointed iron spikes shot out at her through the door. Chapter 8 Leah fell back, and the pointed spikes missed their target. As she stared in horror, the spikes slid back into the door before completely disappearing. But the roar continued, echoing deafeningly through the low attic. She examined herself, gasping for breath, her legs weak and trembling. I'm okay, she said out loud. Is this really happening? she asked herself. Is it real this time? She turned and ran to the trap door, jumping onto the ladder, nearly falling, finally steadying herself by grabbing the top rung with both hands, her heart pounding. Leah pulled the trap door over the opening and slid down the ladder onto the hall floor. She stood there for a long time, leaning against the cold metal, her eyes squeezed tight, trying to catch her breath, trying to stop her knees from shaking. The roar was still echoing in her ears, as if it had followed her down the ladder. She shook her head, trying to rid herself of it, and became aware of another sound, too. A ringing sound, very nearby. It took her several rings to realize it was the phone. Taking in a deep breath and letting it out to calm herself, to slow her racing heartbeat, she made her way into her bedroom, and hurried to the night table to pick up the phone. How long had it been ringing? Hello? Her voice came out shrill and tiny, like a cartoon mouse. Hello, Leah? A boy's voice, very familiar, but she couldn't quite place it. Yes, she replied breathlessly. Who is this? This is Don, Don Jacobs. The voice sounded tinny, far away. Leah could hear a car honking in the background, traffic sounds. She started to talk, but no voice came out. Got to calm down, she told herself. Calm, calm. She cleared her throat and tried again. Hi, Don. Listen, Leah, uh, would you like to come meet me? I'm at the Division Street Mall. Meet you? If only she could clear the roar from her ears. Did he say he wanted her to meet him? Calm. Calm. Yeah, can you? Don asked. I would really like to make it up to you. You know, for breaking that date last Saturday and everything. Don't do it, a voice told her. But Leah had to get out of the house, away from the roar, away from the noises and the room in the attic. Sure, I'll meet you, she said gratefully. Yes, I'm getting out of here, away from this creepy old house. Again she saw the spikes, felt the imagined pain of them shooting into her body, just a few minutes before. Where are you? she asked eagerly, reaching up to push her hair into place to straighten her bangs. What? I'm at a payphone. It's very noisy here, he said over a honking car horn. Where shall I meet you? she asked, shouting into her phone. How about Pete's Pizza? Do you know where it is? I'm not sure, but I'll find it. Great, Leah. Great. Hurry, okay? Maybe we can still catch a movie, if it's not too late. Okay, bye, Don. I'm on my way. Leah hung up and started to her closet, then back to the phone, then to the closet. Then she finally stopped in the middle of the room. Is the room spinning, or am I, she wondered. She slid down onto the edge of her bed, breathing hard, and closed her eyes. She felt queasy. The roaring in her ears continued, just loud enough to be unsettling. I've got to get out of here, she thought. I can't believe he called. What good timing. She jumped up, feeling quivery all over, still unable to shake away the fear. Somehow she managed to pull some clothes from the closet. A clean pair of tan corduroy slacks and a new yellow Benetton sweater. Somehow she managed to get dressed and find the car keys and pull on her down jacket and lock the front door and back the car down the drive. The little ten-year-old Honda Civic that had become mostly her car and somehow she had driven through the dark, unfamiliar streets to the mall. 
It began to rain as she pulled into the nearly vacant parking lot. Most stores closed at nine. Several rows were still filled at one end of the lot. Most likely they were near the movie theater, she figured. The windshield wiper scraped noisily, smearing the glass, making it even harder for Leah to see as the rain battered down, attacking the little car. What am I doing here? Leah thought. Going to meet Don, she answered. The thought cheered her. The sound of the rain made the roaring in her head finally disappear. She pulled into a spot at the end of the first row, cut the engine and the headlights, the wiper sliding noisily into place. Then, holding her jacket over her head as a rain hood, she ran across the puddled asphalt to the nearest entrance. The glass door was locked. Keeping the coat above her head, Leah checked in both directions and saw the signs for the movie theater to her left. As she jogged in that direction, the wind blowing a spray of cold rain onto her face, her sneakers splashed into a deep puddle. She felt cold water soak into the cuffs of her corduroy pants. I'm going to look great when I finally get there, she thought miserably. The rain let up a bit. The double-doored entrance beside the six-plex theater was open, and Leah eagerly stepped inside. She lowered her jacket and shook herself like a dog after a swim, water splashing onto the bright patterned carpet. Pete's Pizza was directly across from the movie theater. Leah could see that it was crowded, mostly with young people. Laughter and loud voices drifted out into the mall, along with a tangy aroma of cheese and tomato sauce. Straightening her hair with her hand, she half ran, half walked toward the restaurant pulling off the down jacket and tugging her sweater down. As she stepped through the open entranceway, the voices grew louder. As she walked past the cashier in front, she saw Don. He was sitting in a booth in the middle of the restaurant, facing her. She gave him a quick wave, but he didn't seem to notice her. Hi, Don, Leah called happily, stepping up to the booth and starting to toss her jacket down. And then she saw that someone else was sitting across the table from him. Marcy! Oh, Leah uttered weakly her mouth dropping open. Marcy turned to Leah. What are you doing here? she demanded nastily. I... Leah looked at Don, but he only blushed and gave a quick, almost imperceptible shrug before turning away in embarrassment. I just wanted to say hi, Leah stammered, feeling her face redden. Don was signaling her with his eyes now, obviously trying to tell Leah that this wasn't his idea, that Marcy had just shown up. It's so great to see you, Marcy said sarcastically. But Don and I really would like to be alone. She reached across the table and put her hand over Don's. Don seems to be very uncomfortable, but he didn't pull his hand away. Uh, Leah, why don't you join us? He asked. He's really weak, Leah decided. No thanks, I've got to go. Have a nice night, Leah said, trying to sound cool and together. But her voice quavered when she said it, revealing how upset she was. She ran blindly toward the doorway and collided with a waitress carrying a tray of sodas. The waitress screamed. The tray hit the floor with a clattering crash. Glasses shattered. A river of brown soda rolled over the floor. Oh, I'm sorry, Leah cried, much louder than she had intended. Everyone turned to gawk. Leah saw Marcy and Don staring at her. Marcy, craning her neck to see, had a broad grin on her face. Ready to burst with rage, Leah fled into the nearly empty mall and kept running. Her jacket held out in front of her until she was back in the rain. I could kill Marcy, she thought. Kill her. How could Don do this to me? The steady rain felt cold in her hair, on her shoulders as it soaked through her sweater, but she didn't put on the jacket. She walked slowly now, as if in a daze, not even sure if she was heading in the right direction. The rush of the rain drowned out all other sounds. But she could still hear Marcy's haughty voice repeating in her ears. Don and I really would like to be alone. I've never been so humiliated, Leah thought. Rivulets of cold rainwater dripping down her forehead and cheeks. Still carrying her jacket in both hands, she didn't bother to brush the rain away. What did I ever do to her, anyway? And what is Don's problem? Is he totally terrified of her? Did he deliberately trick me? Did she make him call me tonight? Was it his idea? He acted so embarrassed, so uncomfortable when I arrived. It couldn't have been his idea, Leah decided. Marcy must have arrived after he called me. Why did he just sit there? Why didn't he do anything to help me? She opened the car door and tossed her jacket across the seat. Then she slid behind the wheel, totally drenched, shivering from the cold, but too angry, too furious to notice. Never again, she thought, fumbling in her jacket pocket for the car keys. Never again. Back to the dreary, empty house. Up to her bedroom, pulling the wet sweater off over her head. She took a hot shower and shampooed her hair, but it didn't make her feel any better. 
I never would have gone if I hadn't been so terrified to stay home alone, she thought. I never would have agreed to meet him if I had been thinking clearly. Well, now Marcy will have another hilarious story to tell her friends, Leah thought bitterly, climbing into bed, and everyone at Shadyside will have another big laugh at my expense. She could feel tears welling up in her eyes and fought back the urge to cry. I could kill Marcy. I really could. Her bitter thoughts are interrupted just then by sounds right above her head. Footsteps again. The ceiling creaked under their weight. They were footsteps, no doubt about it, right over her head. Thud, thud, thud. Then back the other way. Thud, thud, thud. Chapter 9 I won't be stopped this time, Leah told herself. I'm going to find out who is walking up there, and I won't be frightened away. She had pulled on her robe and rubber thongs and was climbing the ladder outside her room. A fat, black fly buzzed slowly around a light fixture in the hallway, one of the last flies of autumn. Don't you know you're supposed to be dead? Leah called to it, just to hear her voice. She pushed the trapdoor up and away and blinked, surprised to find the attic light on. Then she remembered that she must have left it on when she fled the attic earlier. I'm not going to run this time, she thought, pulling herself up into the yellow light of the attic and climbing to her feet, wrapping the robe around her retying the cloth belt more securely. This time I'm going to learn your secret, she said loudly to the locked door. Talking out loud seems to give her courage to strengthen her resolve. She stood a few feet from the door, studying it, her eyes moving slowly from the top to the floor. No traces of blood, no iron spikes, no roar. She took a tentative step closer, the floorboard squeaking in protest beneath her. She leaned forward to examine the door in the strange yellow light. The boards crisscrossing the door were covered with a thick layer of dust she saw. They were lined with deep ruts and cracks, and were warped from age and from the dryness of the attic. The nail heads protruding from the two-by-fours were rusted. One of the boards was nearly cracked in half and sagged in the middle, held up by only a few nails. It was obvious even to Leah, who didn't have much knowledge or skill in carpentry, that the nails had been hastily pounded in. Many of them were crooked, the nail head sticking out at odd angles. Some of the nails had been pounded in only halfway. Whoever put these boards up, Leah thought, wasn't much of a carpenter or was in a terribly big hurry. Mrs. Thomas, the real estate agent, had said that the door had been locked up and boarded for over a hundred years. The boards looked that old, Leah decided, but the door itself could have been put up the day before. The wood was smooth and unblemished. It didn't appear the least bit warped or cracked. Nor did the brass doorknob show any age. It was bright, shiny almost, as if it were regularly polished. Studying the door carefully, scientifically, made Leah feel more confident. She stepped right up to the door and, pressing her ear against the smooth wood, listened. She pulled away quickly. It sounded as if someone was crying on the other side. Leaning both arms against the door, pressing her face forward, she listened again. Yes, it sounded like a young person in there and that person was sobbing. Hello, Leah called excitedly. Is someone in there? Can you hear me? She listened. The crying stopped. There was only silence. Then a girl's voice, muffled by the thick door, but clear enough to hear, called out to Leah. Open the door, please. Open the door. Leah left back in surprise. Oh, there really was someone on the other side. Someone locked in, boarded up. But how could that be? Taking a deep breath, Leah moved back to the door. Who are you? she shouted loudly. Silence. Who are you? How did you get in there? Leah asked. Silence. Then the girl's voice pleading again, sounding very frightened, very unhappy. Open the door, please. Open the door. Leah stared open-mouthed. Should she do it? Should she open the door? Chapter 10 Please, open the door. The girl on the other side of the door repeated her desperate plea. Please! Leah was frozen by indecision. A frightening picture flashed into her mind. She saw a hideous monster with red eyes bulging out of its sockets and green slime drooling from its fang-filled mouth. The monster was hulking on the other side of the locked door, disguising its voice, using the voice of a frightened girl in order to fool Leah. Once the door was opened, it would crowl on its natural, disgusting, horrifying voice and pounce. Leah closed her eyes tightly and forced a gruesome picture from her mind. Please, open the door, the muffled voice, now even more frightened and desperate, called out to Leah. 
Uh, I'll be right back, Leah replied. She had made her decision. She had decided to unlock the door. Down the ladder, through the hallway, and down the stairs, her heart pounding, her mind racing crazily from thought to thought, wild pictures forming in her head of what the girl inside the room looked like. She found her father's big metal tool chest in the back pantry behind the kitchen. She shuffled through it, her hands moving rapidly, randomly tossing things aside, until she found the biggest claw hammer she could find. She found a small sledgehammer behind the chest and grabbed it too. And then, back up the stairs, tools in hand. She glanced at the clock on the kitchen stove as she passed. Nearly midnight. Her parents should be home soon. What a surprise for them, she thought. What a surprise for everyone. Cradling the heavy tools in her arms, Leah struggled back up the metal ladder and hurried to the locked attic door. Are you still there? she called loudly, dropping the sledgehammer to the floor. Yes. The voice sounded so tiny now, so far away. Will you be so kind as to open the door? Uh, I'll try, Leah said uncertainly. Please, open the door. I'm going to try, Leah repeated as loudly as she could. The girl sounded so distant, Leah wasn't sure she could hear her. Leah reached up and pulled on the highest two-by-four. It gave slightly and pulled away from the door frame. Not bad, Leah thought encouraged. This may not be as hard as I thought. She changed the position of her hands on the board, gripping it tightly, and tugged. The board was dry and had weakened over the years. It cracked and squeaked as one end pulled completely off the frame, leaving the nails in place. Leah used a claw hammer on the other end and pried it off quickly, almost effortlessly. She let the board fall to the floor at her feet, then bent over and tugged it out of the way. One down, two more to go, she thought, pleased with herself. The old boards were practically rotten, she realized. She pulled the remaining two off as easily as the first. She didn't even need the hammer, and dragged them to the center of the floor. Are you okay in there? Leah called in. Silence. Can you hear me? Are you okay? Please, open the door, the voice called. I'm trying, Leah shouted. Now I just have to figure out how to unlock the door. Please hurry, the girl called. Leah bent down to examine the doorknob and the lock beneath it. To her shock, she saw a brass key in the lock. There's a key, Leah announced excitedly to the girl on the other side. I can unlock the door now. Please, unlock it, the voice pleaded. Leah paused for a brief moment, her hand gripping the metal key. Once again, she pictured a hulking monster, covered in hair and slime and blood, waiting eagerly on the other side, cleverly calling to her in its best imitation of a girl's voice. But Leah hesitated for only a second. Then she turned the key. Leah turned the knob and pulled open the heavy door.